I'm going to try to leave this uh, microphone on the stand because I tend to wave my hands with I, when I talk. So, uh, wow, Mark, I was trying not to get emotional, and uh, with that kind of introduction, it's kind of hard to, to, to not get emotional. Very kind words today. What a wonderful turnout. I'd also like to thank the food servers at the back. I mean, y'all processed 180 people in just a few minutes, so outstanding job, and the quality of food was good as well. So thank you. Thank you very much. I also, where's Matt Swerick? Uh, Matt, okay, so in the true uh, Christian generosity, I got over here and I was looking at my notes, and one of the afflictions of getting my age is that you can't see anything unless you have reading glasses on. Well, I was tapping all my pockets and I didn't have any reading glasses, and so Matt, uh, thank you for your reading glasses, <laughs> and, uh, and hopefully I'll get them back to you after the talk is over with. So, again, uh, my name is Travis Tyson, and what I'm going to talk about today is uh, my leadership journey, and I want to pause for a minute and focus on the, the use of the word my, because this is my leadership journey, and I hope there's a few nuggets that I can talk about today that uh, maybe resonate at your small groups, because I think after I sit down and, and, and get finished talking, you guys are going to have an opportunity to talk about a few of the things that, uh, that I mentioned today. Uh, and I hope that some of the things that, that I say are thought-provoking. So we'll do a little, we'll do a little uh, group table discussion, and then I think I'll come up and we'll do, we'll do some Q&A. But I think really what I'm most excited about today, not only to be in a group of Christian men of this magnitude, uh, which is humbling, to be honest, to, to look around this room, but I'm really excited about the opportunity to talk about something other than Diamondback Energy. It seems like in my publicly traded world, all I can ever talk about or all that I'm ever required to talk about is Diamondback Energy. And as such, I can do so in any environment against any side of crowd, you know, extemporaneously or through prepared remarks. That's just sort of my stock and trade. But when you actually get an opportunity where a group of men, uh, as esteemed as the group of men asked me to, to speak at today's deal, you know, it, it, it resonates deep within your core because you have an opportunity now in a rare venue to talk about something that you can't talk about in the secular world. You can talk about matters of faith. And so I hope through that course of today, I'm going to give you some examples maybe of things that have been instrumental and transformational in my life and perhaps uh, maybe make a difference in yours. So what I'm going to do today is compartmentalize my thoughts really into three buckets. And I found over the years that I try not to com complicate things too much. And if I try to remember more than about three things at any one point in time, I usually fail and can only remember three. So I'm going to keep my talk to three points today and uh, to describe my journey. And Here's the three, and we're going to talk about each of these in a little bit more detail. Can I just do a sound check at the back? Am I close enough to the microphone? Can y'all? Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, so let's examine the first. I'm going to talk about my journey to servant leadership. And in order for me to do that, I kind of got to back you up to when I started my career in 1985. Uh, I was an individual contributor from, uh, for Mobile Oil, and I spent the first eight years of my career as an individual contributor which means I did what my boss told me to do and, and tried to do it in a way that allowed my career to advance. Well, somewhere along that way, I don't really remember exactly when it occurred to me, but I became, it was obvious to me that if I was going to make a living in the oil and gas business, it wasn't going to be on the strength of my technical ability. So like a lot of the managers in the room, I said, hey, I need to get into management to advance my career. So somewhere along that way, I raised my hand and said, hey, I'd like to I'd like to try this supervisory management thing. So I got my first opportunity in 1993. Now in and of itself, that's not a meritorious event, but there were four of us, and we were all working for Burlington Resources at the time, there were four of us that got promoted on the exact same day, July 1st, 1993. And we all went to Canada, Farmington, Midlands, Houston, uh, and they were compadres of mine, uh, co-workers, and I would call them friends. And so we went through that first year in supervisory training, you know, where we all went and got the HR training and we got, you know, how to write goals and objectives and, you know, we had to figure out how to tie back into the corporate expectations. And f by my measures, I thought everything I was doing was fine. Well, one year later, July 1st, 1994, an organizational announcement comes out where three of those original four supervisors were promoted to the next level and one of them wasn't. And the one that wasn't was old Huckleberry here. And uh, being mildly, and those guys that work with me might choose to argue my adjective, but being mildly competitive, uh, that just flew all over me. And so 
uh, I started spinning out and I, and I tried to justify, I went back and looked at everything I had accomplished, you know, as a supervisor and I looked at, you know, the job title criteria that I was supposed to be held accountable to and I looked at the goals and objectives that I had for my work group and, and I was convinced that I had done everything that I needed to do to be promoted. And so I was tempted ever so briefly to pick up that victim flag victim, uh, as in V, victim flag. And that victim flag, some of you might be familiar with it, that's where, you know, you say, well, I've been, I've been harmed in some way. And the, the danger in that victim flag, and this is sort of a step aside to my talk, but the danger in that victim flag is that if you pick it up, it's one of those things that you can't ever turn loose. And most people end up carrying that victim flag around with them the rest of their careers. But by the grace of God, I left it on the ground where it belonged. But I was sitting in my office one afternoon, and a manager came by my office uh, and said, hey, Travis, how you doing? And I was stewing in my own juices and uh, uh, had a little fire in my, in my belly. And uh, he came in and said, uh, well, what, 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 where's your head right now? And I said, well, and some of you guys might know this gentleman. He lived here in Midland. It's been a couple of decades ago, a guy named Danny Hill. And uh, Danny and Candy, uh, Danny and Candy Hill. But anyway, Danny was a manager. And uh, which means he was a level above me. And I wasn't even up in his reporting functions. But he said, well, what's, what's in your head? And I told him, I said, uh, I said, Danny, I said, uh, something's not right here. I said, I just feel like I should have been promoted. And so uh, Danny and I had a conversation in, in my office there. And through that course of the conversation, I was beginning to understand that my logic to success was flawed because it was not about what I did. And if you guys remembered my prior little dialogue there. I was measuring everything that I was accomplishing, you know, and, and I was a manager supervisor. And it's not really about what I was doing, but it's about what I was doing that allowed other people to be more successful. And what, you know, Danny really was reinforcing in me is that what servant leadership required was caring about others in a way that allowed them to be successful. Well, this story doesn't end there because what really drove that point home that afternoon uh, in my office was Danny said, okay, Travis, uh, who can you think of that exemplifies uh, all of the attributes we were just talking about, about being a servant leader? And so I was sitting there in my Rolodex going, going around in my head, I'm sorry, younger audience, that'd be like your, uh, your iPhone and thumbing through your contacts. <laughs> So as I was thumbing through my list of contacts in my iPhone, uh, I kept coming up with names. And these are, these are you know, individuals with some, with some merit. And, and I would talk to Danny about, well, here's this individual. Obviously, I'm not going to use names, but here's this individual. And we would kind of go back and forth. And, and I could see that what Danny was asking me to describe in the form of servant leadership wasn't being met in the individuals that I was trying to describe. And so I kind of trailed off there. And, uh, and, and what I think in a moment of courage, uh, Danny said, uh, he said, well, Travis, what about Jesus Christ? And so right there, you know, all my alarms went off, you know, because I just finished up with all my HR training, right? And so I know you can't talk about, you know, religion, you know, uh, sex, uh, uh, you know, things that you, you're not supposed to talk about in a, in a secular world. So I was trying to figure out, okay, Danny, uh, is that it's a trap? Now, you know, I, I had a faith walk even, you know, even back in 93. And so I knew who Jesus Christ was and I knew he was an important in my life, but I didn't know how to translate what Danny was asking me to um, in the course of that conversation. But Danny's courage uh, in being able to share with me that concept of servant leadership using Jesus as an example changed my, leader, my leadership perspective from that day forward. Because from that day forward, I became, um, I became less focused about myself and more focused about other people. I became less intent on individual success and I became more other people oriented. And so really the, the bottom line to the application of servant leaders, and I look around the room guys and there's some wonderful uh, servant leaders that, have, that are running companies out here that are, that are beautiful examples of servant leaders. But the bottom line to the application of servant leadership is that we don't need to emulate the examples of this world. Our example is Jesus who came as a servant and therefore our mission is to serve one another and to give of ourselves. And that means inside the workplace as well as you know, in your faith groups and at church on Sunday mornings in your Sunday school class. So what does Scripture tell us about servant leadership? Whoever wants to become great among you must be your servant. 
And whoever wants to be first must be your slave. Just as the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve, and to give His life as ransom for many. That's from Matthew 20, verses 26 through 28. So, you know, in a Christian world, like we're in today in this setting, really all leadership is servant leadership. Also looking at Mark 9, verse 35, Jesus sat down and He called the twelve. And He said to them, If anyone would be first, he must be last of all and servant of all. So, you know, I've got a, a really nice spiritual and scriptural background to the example that we want to kind of, that we want to, that we want to try to emulate in the form of Jesus Christ. So the second thing I wanted to discuss with you is along my, my uh, leadership journey is how integrity helped me navigate, uh, you know, my, uh, my day to day activities. So I think the simplest definition of integrity, and again, you know, as I told you, I can't remember more than three things, and also when I define things, I've got to make it as simple as I can so I can remember it. But the simplest definition of integrity is what you do when no one else is watching. What you do when no one else is watching. Um, I also think it goes back to my mom. Uh, always beating it into my head and on some occasions the other parts of my anatomy that says, Travis, always do the right thing. Um, I think even in today's complicated business world, you know, where sometimes black is gray and sometimes white is gray, you know, the ability to do the right thing uh, is extremely important. And just as an aside, I kind of wonder what our youth of our society today would be like had they been you know, uh, influenced at a very early age to constantly do the right thing. So, in my personal life, consistently applying integrity has allowed me to protect my marriage over 31 years now, keep me out of situations where sin is prevalent, and in general, been a pretty darn good guide in just about everything that, that this world can throw at you. So, in my work life, you know, I've been fortunate enough to ex be exposed to a lot of business deals. And doing the right thing and exercising integrity at times has made the deal flow perhaps more complicated. It's, uh, it's made certain points more, protract more protracted in the negotiation. And at times it might have even cost you know, the side of the table that I was sitting on more money. But at the end of the day, I was able to hold my head up proudly and know that I did the right thing and that I exercised integrity. The other thing about integrity, and this is important, uh, especially to the younger guys in, in the room. Uh, us older guys probably have learned this the hard way. But integrity is not a part-time endeavor. Integrity is one of those things that's either on or off. And what you have to guard against is that what I call one half of one percent. Let me give you an example of, of how you, you can violate your integrity by just only one half of one percent. Now we all fail, but if you've ever found yourself in a situation where you said, Hey, it's not that big a deal. I'll just do it this once. Okay, that's that one half of one percent that you got to guard against. Integrity is a really funny thing. It's about the only attribute that I can really think of that so clearly is either a hundred percent or zero. Or said another way, integrity is one of those things that should govern your life that you either have or you don't have. And so again, turning to scripture uh, in the book of Job. Chapter 27, my lips will not speak falsehood, and my tongue will not utter deceit. Far be it from me to say that you are right. Till I die, I will not put away my integrity from me. I hold fast my righteousness and will not let go. My heart does not reproach me for any of my days. And one last verse, the book of Proverbs, boy, even in the business world, the book of Proverbs is just a wonderful way to, uh, to navigate yourself. But this comes out of chapter 10, verse 9. Whoever walks in integrity walks securely, but he who makes his ways crooked will be found out. That's pretty important for a publicly traded CEO to, to have that as his operating mantra, I can guarantee you that. So the third and final discussion point this afternoon is about compassion. And it's probably for me, as I stand in front of you, one of the more difficult things to discuss because compassion, the way I view compassion, involves very painful life experiences. But it's because of these life experiences that I believe I became a more compassionate leader. And so I'm going to share with you 
a couple of my life experiences that have allowed me to be more compassionate. I also believe that there is a direct correlation between being compassionate and being a servant leader that we talked about earlier. And as I look around the room, you know, again, I'm, I'm really pleased that there's so many young people here that you might not have had any of these painful life experiences, and maybe you won't, uh, and that would be a blessing. But again, I'm just going to share you with a couple, share with you a couple of mine, because I do think it's, uh, it's it was transformational, and as as I understand dealing with other people. I have a special needs son named Matthew who's 25 years old. Matthew essentially can't do anything for himself. Uh, he's nonverbal. He's medically fragile. Um, he's got profound intellectual and uh, development impairments. So, uh, <clears throat> so trying to raise a child like Matt would uh, soften even the hardest of hearts. And uh, one of the things about raising a child like Matt is that it helps keep you keeps you properly grounded because when you see Matt struggle with just the most basic of life functions, it sort of keeps you in perspective, you know, about what you deal with on a day-to-day -day basis. Uh, my wife's a cancer survivor, but by the grace of God, she's been 10 years in her mission. Um, but it was an honor to watch her uh, go through that journey with her faith absolutely unshakable, even in the darkest days of chemotherapy. Um, I buried a mom after watching her suffer with, through Lou Gehrig's disease and a father-in-law uh, who died from Alzheimer's disease. So let me tell you, I'm not, I know that kind of sounded like a downer, but I'm not telling you these things because I'm looking for sympathy or I want you to pity me. W or what I'm telling you that I'm not unique in carrying these crosses, but those life experiences, I believe, have allowed me to be a much more compassionate person and a compassionate leader. My wife tells me that if everyone was to put their cross in the center of the table and we all had perfect eyesight on what everybody else's crosses were, we would pick ours right back up. That's a pretty good perspective to think about carrying a cross. Uh, so back to the secular world, um, when someone that you work with in the workplace, life throws them a curveball or just some other otherwise personal tragedy, uh, I, I think I'm better equipped to show compassion because of what they've gone through, what I've gone through, sorry. Uh, our very first vice president of land was a gentleman named uh, Bill Franklin. Uh, about a week after he came to work for Diamondback, I think he was employee number six, uh, Bill was diagnosed with pancreatic cancer and ultimately died uh, from that horrible disease. But I hope that Bill felt that not only the role that I played as, as his leader, I, felt, I hope he felt compassion and as well as his family felt compassion as well during his very difficult journey. So, turning to Scripture again, Jesus Christ, the, the Son of God, exemplified all of the fa Father's attributes, including His compassion. When Jesus saw His friends weeping at the grave of Lazarus, He felt compassion for them and wept alongside them. That's out of the book of John, chapter 11, verses 33 and 35. Also in Matthew, chapter 9, 36, when Jesus saw the crowds, He had compassion for them because they were harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. So I promised only three things I was going to talk to you about today, uh, but there is one of the things I kind of want to close on. It's, it's what my wife calls me an affliction of being an engineer. Now, you don't have to be an engineer to be afflicted with this, and I'm going to describe it here in a minute. But, but namely, it's dealing with every decision point, every fact pattern that you're trying to analyze, dealing with it in a way that is probabilistic. So you look at the full range of probabilities and you say, okay, what if this, what if that? And you examine the whole range of probabilities. And I find it, you know, in some way almost comical because uh, God doesn't really ask us to deal in probabilities. He asks us to deal in His possibilities. And so um, my wife again uh, tells me that that affliction that I have of dealing with probabilities is the way that I invent things to worry about and stay up all night. And she's right. Um, but the way that I think I've learned to reconcile those two things is that I need to acknowledge the probabilities, but I need to embrace the possibilities. And uh, I think that point was... Um, was really driven home to me. I was trying to explain to my son, 22-year-old Luke, that uh, 
I was trying to say, okay, look, look, here's this way I look at things, probabilities. And Luke is blessed to be like his mother. He doesn't deal in probabilities. He deals 100% in the world of possibilities. It's a wonderful way to go through life if you can do that. Um, but he asked me, he said, uh, Pops, he said, and this, this is what really, it really struck me. He said, Pops, what were the probabilities after you left Laredo five years ago that you were going to be the CEO of a $5 billion company? And again, I was struck by a couple of things. One, the amazing depth that that young man has at age 22 compared to where I was at 22. But secondarily, he was right. You know, uh, it certainly wasn't very probable, but in God's plan, it was possible. So God's words to us uh, are pretty clear about worry. He really just asks us, be still, hear my voice, and trust in me. Notice those are three things I can remember again. So again, uh, quoting my wife, she tells me repeatedly that faith and worry cannot coexist. Faith and worry cannot coexist. I'm going to tell you, I'll kick my coverage with that woman. Um, let me turn to a couple of scriptures here. The, the Bible clearly teaches that Christians are not to worry. One of my favorite verses is Philippians uh, chapter 4, verse 6. We're commanded. Pretty strong words there. We're commanded. Do not be anxious. Now, anxious is just another word for worry. Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your request to God. So in this scripture, we learn that we should bring all of our needs and concerns to God in prayer rather than worry about them. So Jesus encourages us to avoid worrying about our physical needs, even things like clothing and food. He assures us that our Heavenly Father is going to take care of everything. In fact, if you turn to Matthew 6, verses 25 through 34, He spells it out pretty clearly for us. Therefore, we don't have anything to worry about. And I struggle with that every day. But very clearly, God says, I got this. So wrapping up, uh, I hope today that you can kind of see a common theme in my talk. And what I tried to do is weave a thread through my journey towards becoming an effective servant leader. A thread between integrity and compassion. And most significantly, that thread is Jesus Christ. If, uh, you know, if you, if you find yourself struggling in the secular world with trying to help someone, you know, in a, in a faith-based way, I encourage you to at least think about the words that St. Francis told us. He said, preach the gospel. If necessary, use words. Um, Jesus is as present today as He was 2,000 years ago. It's up to us. We just got to figure out how to look for Him. So there's a, there's a good chance I wouldn't be here today had Danny Hill not had the courage to take off his secular world coaching hat and encourage me to think about the examples that we need to move through life in the form of Jesus Christ. I think even more humbling um, was as I thought and prepared through this talk, I wondered, have I been a Danny Hill to anybody? And I tell you, um, that, that one left a mark. Because whether I had been or haven't been, clearly I couldn't, I couldn't enumerate the times where I thought I had been. So, you know, hopefully I've got another th th uh, 30 years on this, on this earth, God willing. So it's my everyday challenge to try to change the trajectory of someone else's career like Danny did mine almost 25 years ago. So I'm, I'm not sure that, uh, you know, that any of my thoughts today were particularly insightful. Uh, hopefully some of the scriptures that, that I quoted might resonate with you. But regardless, and I mean this as passionately and sincerely as I can, it was my profound privilege to share these things with you today. Thank you very much.